start with Tom, and then back to David. Well, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Nasser. I'm co-founder and CEO of Checkmate Digital. Um, I think uh, I'm probably in the closest one to your shoes. I graduated a couple of years ago, uh, four years ago now, from Quinnipiac up in, in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, before I graduated, I ended up uh, successfully failing my first three ventures. Uh, and I say successfully failing because one <laughs> led into the other. Right, so I started one pursuing a specific problem, aggressively drove that one into the ground, wasted all my money, learned a, a, learned a little bit, went into a second venture, uh, third, and now I'm on uh, my fourth with this agency. Um, the agency helps entrepreneurs actually build digital products. So we architect, design, and build uh, applications for entrepreneurs and startups, uh, or help scale ups, somebody that already has had some success uh, pay attention to the types of security precautions or uh, you know, scaling infrastructure they would need to take an application international, for example. Um, so my background is in philosophy and entrepreneurship. Uh, so I had no technical skill uh, coming out of, out of school. And a lot of that came from surrounding myself by people that did have technical skill and were really excited to pursue their own venture and have that type of freedom to pursue their own venture. Um, for me, learning how to design and develop, or at least how not to design and develop, and, and find people around me that, that were really talented, um, was able to take us from you know the early days doing a website for 500 bucks, you know, to try to get anything on the board, um, to building large enterprise applications that you know can scale and, and grow and deliver real value. Um, so you know, today. Uh, we're 17 people over the last over the last three years. We've grown to 17 people um, in New Haven, Connecticut, in Pittsburgh, uh, and hopefully soon, actually in New York. Um, and we focus on helping entrepreneurs turn an idea into reality, actually building product with them um, rather than for them. It's a very collaborative relationship that we have. Um, so today, I'm very happy to talk about uh, you know any of these these failures that I've had. Um, I'm an open book, uh, but you know I'm, I'm a couple years out of school too. So you know I hope that can that can resonate with you, and uh, however I can be of help. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Becky Wang. I uh, run an innovation consultancy and design studio, um, and my uh, entrepreneurial career started with a couple of startups that I worked at um, in San Francisco, so it was um, uh, early 2000s, and I um, often joke that I worked for a startup that didn't realize that the crash had happened. Um, <clears throat> and it was in financial tech, and I learned a lot about AI, text mining, and um, one day I um, was on my way to grad school, and I thought, I don't want to do this. Um, and I think that's probably something a lot of people can relate to. Like, wait, is this what I really want to do? And I ended up going to make movies for a few years. Um, I took a massive pay cut. I went to work for Lawrence's Skin Productions, um, which is under the Sony Pictures banner, Columbia Pictures. She taught me a lot about how in the creative development process, you really need to find your team. It's about um, the relationships you build and the sort of creative banter that you can have. Um, and it was one of the most valuable experiences about what it means to actually create something, whether it's um, a digital product, whether it's a marketing campaign, whether it's a story that you want to tell. Um, while I was swirling around, I went to this little conference called the 140 Conference, which was the early days when Twitter was only outputting 250,000 tweets a day. You would imagine what that means. Um, and uh, I met this small company that was really on, on the edge of um, text analysis. Um, and we built what was essentially one of the, like, the very original Twitter ad products. The company is obviously no longer around. Um, but I was lucky enough in my experience to um, lived through two acquisitions um, that uh, was, it was really great to see what it looks like when a company you work for is successful or at least has some type of exit, which is more most common type of exit. Um, 
and then I uh, had the opportunity to speak about data and creativity and um, an advertising agency came calling and said, hey, um, we think you have a point of view, why don't you come join us? Um, and that started my advertising career. What I realized is the art of selling a story and marketing is actually pretty critical. Understanding your consumer is pretty critical. And no matter how much fancy technology you have, if you're not creating something that actually does something for someone, gets a job done, if you play Christensen, um, you're gonna have a really hard time selling stuff. So um, I had a great time. I built lots of software, I built lots of decks. Um, I ran lots of campaigns, and I'd say probably about five years ago is when I heard my entrepreneurial call. Uh, although in reality, I think agencies in general are, are just very entrepreneurial. Um, and like Tom was sharing, I um, successfully failed, failed successfully. Um, we, we, uh, yeah, well, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, I also started uh, what was a rep company, that, then I started an agency, and what I realized was, uh, I went back to the lessons that I learned when working for Lauren Siskin, which is find your team. And I had the benefit of having some really great partners uh, in my time and then realizing that um, that is really key, I think, to any sort of entrepreneurial endeavor. And a couple times that we realized, um, I'm still friends with all of them, it's like every good breakup, right? Um, that you have to be in the same place. So now our innovation consultancy actually has five of us, five primary partners, even though I'm the founder. Um, and we have support teams, and we, we actually operate like a design studio. And we work with clients who specifically are looking to build direct-to-consumer models. So think of the way media was traditionally, um, you know, they had distributors, right? Um, they, their actual bills are being paid by advertisers. What does it mean to create a direct relationship with consumers? And we found that that was something because of technology and social media, a lot of categories and industries were interested in. And so now we service clients like LVMH, um, Getty Images, Spotify. Um, we actually service a couple agencies as well to really help understand that intersection of uh, content community and commerce uh, with that digital data layer underneath. And a lot of people come to us because they say, you guys are like a creative Deloitte di Digital. We know that um, there's like a creative ethos, you're really trying to connect with people, but we know we're gonna get this strategic thinking behind it. So I have the privilege of helping a lot of entrepreneurs and large agents and large organizations as well as um, new entrepreneurs who are saying, okay, wait, what's my business model? What am I trying to solve? And then collaborating with, you know, awesome teams like Tom, who haven't yet, not yet, not yet um, to actually then go design and build. Um, so there's lots of components, and at the end of the day, I think when you're raising money, you really have to say, what's the problem we're solving for the consumer? Um, and, but also, are we gonna make money doing it? So that's me. I am David Ashenbaugh, I'm a former student of uh, Professor Bavanheimer, uh, who I did in 2012. I'm from France originally, so I do my French college over there. Um, so I created last year a venture fund. Uh, I decided to help early stage technology and other companies because um, so my background at the place I went to for a big investment bank in Paris, uh, for child, for a bit, and then I went to London for a boutique investment bank. And I was servicing some of the top uh, companies, uh, largest companies in the world, and I had access to um, top executives, and the, the work was tremendously interesting, but I felt like I didn't do enough, and um, those big companies, I feel, are very political at the end of the day. And uh, I was always attracted to fast moving case of tech. Therefore, I decided to take my grades into my own hands and in 2016 come back.
back to New York and uh, get into the New York ecosystem of startups. And last year, I decided to finally uh, launch a fund. And uh, thanks to a large network that I have, I am able to, uh, on certain geographies, Europe and the US, find companies that uh, will accelerate uh, Stuff is the, 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 
was while living on campus or off campus, uh, there was a huge noise problem that, that we had. Uh, there was, a, there was you know, police being called uh, on students throwing off campus parties, right? So police paying tax, like tax dollars are going to service non-tax paying houses because that's owned by the university um, that's not paying, paying housing tax. So that was a huge opportunity that we saw in terms of like the misalignment of economics, right? Because the town people are getting upset paying for tax dollars for police to service non-tax paying houses. Um, needless to say, that didn't work out. We, we created a system around that, and raised, it was able to raise some money, learned a lot about it. But it was a problem that I experienced firsthand. Um, there was a level of intent of not trying to create a problem with my neighbor, but you know sometimes there would be. Uh, or my landlord in particular was not the best, so I wanted to rate him like you rate one of your Yeah. Um, there's a much more of a focus on them and their perspective, their ability to adapt and understand the value that they're creating or trying to create for uh, a particular business or sector or uh, addressing a problem that they know and understand way more than the actual business. Like the actual business almost doesn't matter in some cases. In, in a lot of cases, I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen, seen that. It's all about the person and their approach and their ability to perceive and understand and deliver value. Um, so when we're looking at you know, entrepreneurial opportunities, uh, or if you're looking at entrepreneurial uh, opportunities, I'd say there's some stuff that I'm sure everyone in this audience has experienced that you think kind of sucks and you could make better. Um, and that passion, that understanding of whatever the problem is, is going to be way more valuable and way you're much more likely to be able to pursue it and uh, be resilient uh, for all of the all of the stuff you have to put up with in starting a company um, if you actually care about whatever it is you're pursuing. Uh, I, and I say that because uh, far too often I see entrepreneurs that come over and say, "Hey, look, there's this. We can make a million dollars doing this." Well, like. Do you know anything about that? Do you care about that? Is, there, is this even a real problem, or are you just trying to make a dollar? Like, there's a, there's a ton of ways to make money. You want to make money, like, just exclusively for the opportunity to make money? Do, yeah, go to finance. Do, do, do something else. Entrepreneurialism is not for you. Um, it, it, I think it's been, you know, romanticized a little bit uh, in, you know, the last couple of years. But the point is, the entrepreneurial opportunities that you'll be able to find are already in your own life. You experience these problems every day, every so often, something like that, and you you have that perspective, and you'll be able to understand and pursue those problems um, much better than someone else who's not passionate about it. Um, so that, you know, it's not this silver bullet that oh, these entrepreneurial like uh, opportunities are like you know down on Fifth Ave or something. It's like you know, look in your own life, how you're going through through your experiences, and you'll see problems in the the system that you engage with every day. Uh, it's just a matter of if you're aware enough to recognize it and then passionate enough to actually pursue it. Uh, so, that's, that's my thought. Oh, thank you. So, you know, that was a, a quick thought on, on identifying opportunities and um, the lead in um, to, to actually pursue it. The, the second of the, the five things we're going to talk about today is creating a new venture. And I, I wanted to, to ask the panelists, you know, they could share a thought and insight and takeaway on you know, they've each started different types of businesses on some kind of a unique challenge or surprise that you encountered. You, you, you may have done um, meticulous planning and you know, things happen. Um, you know, the old cliche everything costs twice as much and takes you know, twice as long. But um, you know, what were some of those? Unique challenges and surprises when it came to actually creating or implementing the new business. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so, uh, just one of the things that I really did not think about in creating a new business and hiring people is that um, you know people actually continue to live life, get married, buy houses, have kids. Uh, that, that suddenly you're responsible for, right? If you have employees and, and you have a widget that you sell and you make money um, and you pay those people, like, you know, there, there's things that are outside of your control that happen. Uh, be aware of that. Uh, <laughs> that. That wasn't top of mind, you know, three years ago when, when you 
know, we started programming websites. I wasn't thinking, you know, my co-founder would have a, a baby on the way, right? Like that's a pretty, pretty serious deal. Uh, but it's also like super rewarding, right? So, so in creating a new venture, there's the really small slice of things that you know that you know, and then a really big slice of things that you don't know that you don't know yet. Uh, and, and being aware that you are gonna have things that you don't know that you don't know, and having the, the, the tooling, the trust, the team to be able to adapt and adjust um, is sort of how you go from you know, zero to one in terms of, of time, right? It, survival is the name of the game, at least in the beginning. Um, I think I have a, a little bit of a different case uh, than some of the other panelists because I never raised money. So I, I don't know what that world is like. Um, haven't yet. We'll see what happens. But um, like needing to make ends meet and, and continue a new venture, uh, scrappiness is an essential quality uh, and sleep is optional. Um, and, and know that, it will at least expect the first year and a half, the first two years to just be terrible. Like, go into it expecting that, and if it's not, great. You know, you're doing something right. Uh, but it's hard, and, and it, it's really hard to uh, understand the value that you're actually, you know, selling uh, if that's not, you know, a, a thought that you have in the beginning. Um, you know, how do you actually go about creating this new venture? Uh, trying to protect it with things like NDAs or, or all the legalese and filing for all your stuff and writing this big plan. Um, I think more often than not, you probably do it for yourself uh, more than, than real external factors or threats. Uh, you know, the passionate entrepreneurs are the one that's going to go through uh, all the stuff that you have to go through to actually you know, make it. Um, more than likely, someone's not going to steal your idea, at least I haven't seen it uh, firsthand. Um, you know, usually someone who's that passionate about something has a real thing, right? Um, that's, that's usually the way people work. Uh, but creating, you know, the early days in creating your own venture, uh, it's really being hyper aware of learning uh, and trying to understand the things that you don't know that you didn't know. And that's just a really hard thing to wrap your head around when you're going into a new space, you're trying something for the first time, you're with a group of people that hopefully you can trust and rely on in that way. Uh, but you know, there, there's, there's a big unknown factor. And, and that's something that you should be comfortable with and excited about. Because uh, once you go through that, you're then more qualified than the next person to, to actually be able to adapt and adjust and move in that space. So. Um, this is awesome. <laughs> because I'm going to contradict Tom. Okay, let's do it. Um, <clears throat> so it is true in the early days, of, at least my personal experience, I didn't sleep very often. And actually, it wasn't, three things happened. One was, um, when I really thought about what I was good at, and what I wanted to do, and what I felt was serving a higher purpose, that's when we became an innovation strategy and design shop. And that's when our revenue tripled in six months. Um, because I was passionate. I also started sleeping. Uh, and it was a personal choice I made, and what I realized is, the tyranny of time as entrepreneurs is something that we put on ourselves. It's not to say that we don't have bills to pay. I'll tell you, sometimes I get crazy when I work with new uh, consultants because part of our setup is that we have a network of experts, right? Because um, they're just things that I don't know about um, or any of the other partners, but we have to be able to call on it. And my, like sometimes I'll get things where someone will submit a bill and put sales tax on it. And I always send the same email, a link to the New York tax code and say, professional services are not subject to sales tax. Or somebody who writes me a note and says, um, so uh, I need to get paid all up front. I was like, that's not how billing works. Or so I need, and they will ask all these questions. And what I realized is because um, I need to take care of myself and I need to take care of my team. And in order to scale the business, I need to trust my team members, right? And I think, it, so I'm not necessarily contradicting you, but what I'm saying is what you're really negotiating in those early years is what works best for you. And that it is a long game and you have to be taking care of your health. You have to be taking care of your personal relationships. You have to be taking care of your professional relationships. In our early years, we had clients that would sue us. Um, we had clients who stole software we built, locked us out of servers, 
and I would ask myself, how did that happen? Like, am I, are we those type of people that would do that and it's reflecting back on us? And what I realized was um, we were chasing the money and we were taking time to really see was there a cultural fit with this client. Um, and, um, and again, I always come back to how are you negotiating those relationships, particularly with yourself. And that was what was surprising to us. Right? And it wasn't until I was like, okay, why am I doing this business? Like, it's a services business. I should be able to be making whatever, X million dollars a year and be cash flow positive. And instead, I have like nothing in my savings and totally relying on my $200,000 line of credit. But like, and what you realize is your thinking and the decisions you make take a lot longer in reality to come true because there's so many things you have to do to execute it to do it right. And it always starts with, with your intention and the relationships you build. Um, and that was what um, I think was surprising to me. And like the truth of it is, there is that story out there that entrepreneurship is about a singular passion. That's the story you put up to say that's what entrepreneurship is. And for some people, that is true, right? Um, and I don't, I love that story. Sometimes we tell that story when we, when we brand something. But I found that there are ways in which um, you can take your time. It will take longer to build your business. But you might be, instead of an overnight success that rises up and crashes, it may take you five, ten years, but that's okay. So I guess, you know, what I want to put out there is it doesn't have to be hard uh, off this, the trope of like you're just <laughs> busting your hump and that's the thing. And what makes it hard, I think, is the, the pieces of yourself that you have to be like, I'm really anxious about this and I can't sleep because it's not going the way that I want, rather than saying, okay, what's that piece of me that's super anxious? What's really going on? Um, so I just want to make that distinction. I think, uh, well, one is I, I love the tyranny of time is something we put um, on ourselves. But I think in a way it can also be very helpful for college students, especially you know, the first year when you come in and you know, there's a lot of stress and anxiety um, in school. And I, I had that. I used to sleep from 4 to 8 in the morning, seven days a week when I had a startup in Australia. And then I suddenly thought, well, what happens if a day is 10 hours instead of 24 hours? If Working that now is that enough? Like, you know, in a, in a way that kind of time is somewhat relative, and we do put it on our ourselves. And um, you know, there's the expression a goldfish grows to the size of the bowl it's in, and sometimes you have to be conscious about that. Sure. But David, so um, so for my dad, I would say that to create a successful new venture, you have to be surrounded by by people that support you and you have to have a strong support system. Family, friends, or advisors, people we can trust and, and uh, bounce ideas off. Um, and the other thing that would stress is very important is uh, uh, try not to go into an entrepreneurial adventure alone, but have a team. And that team will be uh, critical for the success of the, the venture of the long term. entrepreneurs believe are really important when pitching and trying to raise capital. Can you talk a little bit about what you think some of those things that they think are really important that you don't think are that important? You know, or, or what's important to you and what do you think entrepreneurs might mistakenly think is, uh, is really important when pitching to an investor or a potential investor? Very 
often what happens is when just uh, entrepreneurs, no matter their age, uh, they could be way younger than you, way older than us, no equipment, they're 99% of the time way smarter than you. So it's a very humbling experience to try to understand their way of thinking and what they're trying to build. So often, uh, when it's early stages, uh, they are very passionate about the idea that they have, and uh, they they come up with a magic number that they want uh, because it sounds good, but then they don't really necessarily have anything to really back up uh, why they want so much. I would say um, it's very difficult if you don't have some sort of traction to demonstrate that you're able to execute on what you have in your mind and that they actually market for it. So what I would like to see or what I'm actually looking for when people pitch to me uh, is uh, an ability or, or actually it takes a relationship building, so it takes time to be comfortable with investing. And the, the venture part of the, 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 the space is, is a bit different than other investment spaces because it is sort of like, uh, it's not like when you invest in a, in a stock where you can sell tomorrow or something goes wrong. And you're kind of committed to that company until the end of the Either your fund or the company either goes bankrupt or makes a lot of it's a long term commitment and kind of like you're going to be married, so you don't really get out of it. So it takes a few, let's say a few months in order to be comfortable to invest in a company, even though even if you think the team is great and that it's great. Uh, so definitely I would say it's uh, something that takes time. On the other hand, when you know that it's, when it feels right, you have to jump on it and, and go for it. Because it will be, it, it is such a market that it is not transparent. So if you are stumbling upon something that you think is great, then you have to trust your feelings, especially at this early stage, it's not the data that you can Right? Because now people have taken ownership. 
Um, we have found people raise completely on debt because they can't, right? And they focus on just, um, we do billable services, uh, we show expertise before we automate the process, right? Um, or uh, we're gonna rely on a, a sub-brand services angle before, um, and keep in mind, again, I'm not obviously speaking from a VC perspective, they're gonna look at the fact that you have this cash, and you're like, that's not your real business, I'm not investing in your cash flow, right? I wanna know that you have a process that works. But some people choose, I've had a lot of friends and a lot of people in our client base who are like, I'm never doing VC again because I, I gave up something I didn't want to give up. I was happy I did it the first time, I'm not going to do it again. But a lot of them had the benefit of already being first time entrepreneurs, right? So I think um, what I think has been the most interesting mindset are those people who either understand that the money being invested in, in them is strategic, so they're in good hands, or that um, I think more importantly, how much control, control is probably not the right word, but for lack of a better term, control do they want to give up? How open are they going to be? And if you're an entrepreneur, my sense is you're probably an entrepreneur for life, and many of them go through that uh, process of working with a VC, and for some people it works, and for some people it doesn't, right? But you'll, you'll likely, as an entrepreneur, probably raise money a few times. You know, um, we're actually in the process of, um, I'm actually in the process of launching a company um, within the uh, consultancy, and it's a media company. And <clears throat> media companies haven't really taken investment since 2016, right? It's just not a category that people are interested in anymore because basically it's Google and Facebook that generate all the revenue for media companies. Um, but we have a particular perspective and an audience <coughs> that we're going after, and we just started the process of going out and raising money, and all of our advisors say, be prepared to give this pitch 75, 80, 90 times, because you're looking for the right fit and the right strategic money. So that's, you know, we're about to embark on the journey, so, you know, curious how it ends up in six months. Should you maybe email? I'm trying, but cool. Um, no students hire Becky to do your business. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Um, so I, I have a bit of a different, you know, perspective on raising capital. Um, it's really extending runway, right? That's another way to think about it. Uh, if you're you're doing something that can generate uh, revenue on day one, like a service-based company, um, then that's you know you're probably not going to be able to to raise funding. Uh, if you have a product that you know takes some R&D, takes some some market research, then then you might be able to. Um, so I haven't raised funding personally, but I've been a part of my clients raising funding. So on that side of things, what I've seen been really effective is like when the entrepreneur is actually actively pursuing whatever it is that they're trying to raise funding for, and have some sort of a prototype of it. Like it doesn't even matter how well it works. Uh, or even that you know other people are using it. It's just like, hey, you know, I know, like I had somebody come in uh, the other day that had, did some some black magic on PowerPoint and just made the ugliest, most you know disgusting wireframes of an application through PowerPoint, right? But it doesn't matter that they did that uh, or that, that the quality was so bad. Um, they were able to raise through their network because of who they are and because they showed an active pursuit in their idea, you know, a couple hundred grand around a crappy PowerPoint. Um, the, the point is that you're, if you have a prototype, you have something to show, you're way ahead of somebody else that says, oh, I have this great idea, I wrote a paragraph about it, like, I need a couple hundred grand. Um, so a, a prototype meaning you know, something non-functional that is designed that can demonstrate something called user stories or demonstrate like what the value would be uh, is really valuable. Uh, or a prototype that like functions in a certain way that you get some unique aspect that comes out that otherwise you wouldn't be able to get. Um, and, and just like demonstrating 
one little thing that you can get. If only we had you know, a tech team or something that we can build out a real product and, and get these fancy numbers all the time, right? You can, you can, you can create the story. And, and that was something Becky was saying that I think really should, should be addressed. It's like the story that you're gonna tell um, from the first venture that you pursue to the one that actually ends up being successful, could be the first venture, it might not be. Like this is a cohesive thread that's gonna run through your entrepreneurial career. Uh, so telling that from your first venture and how it leads into the second or the third or actually gets traction and why you need funding now and you can show something that, that does some, you know, does a, does a nice little flip and shows like, hey, I'm pursuing this regardless of whether or not you give me this money, I'm going to make this happen. Um, that, that is like a, a much different power dynamic and you go into a meeting like that uh, really a lot more confident in what you're pursuing uh, in, in you're willing to accept smart money, not just any money, because that, I've seen that work out really bad. Um, it's, it's really like the people that you surround on your team, if you take an investor, you're accepting them onto your team too. Uh, and in a weird way, they're also kind of your boss. Uh, so like, it, it's really, just pay attention to that. Um, and if you're, if you do try to raise money, uh, I'd say go in, absolutely echoing David with, you know, where's this money going to go and why, uh, and tr like tell the story of how this funding now lets me do this later, um, and, and how the building blocks fit together in between from, you know, where you started uh, however long ago when you started the, the pursuit to, you know, this is what I did on my own, this is who I brought in to do X, Y, and Z, uh, and this is why I need the money now because, you know, in 10 months we're going to be doing that. Uh, that storytelling aspect uh, is, is critical to you know getting someone to write a check, and it's in anything, even for your own product or raising funding. Like if you can't tell that story uh, of why you're here and why you're important and, and how it's addressing something uh, something really meaningful, you know you're you're going to be stuck. Good no, way. It makes me think when you're talking about raising money and, and telling a story, raising it creatively. Even if it's um, you know a very rough wireframe or something, this guy Nayan Padre he produced a, a film that a lot of it was was filmed here at Pace about uh, supposedly an, uh, an Indian student at Pace that wanted to get an arranged marriage called when Harry tries to marry, and he said at the beginning you know he didn't have enough money to produce like a sample of the film, and he had to think of a creative way to do this, so he. Um, got some acting students from, from Case at NYU, and when the investors came in, he kind of put on a play to tell the story of his concept of the movie, because he you know didn't have enough money to, to produce a, a short version of the movie. So I just thought it was a, a creative way to tell the story um, and to raise money. Um, I'll, we have two more, and I, um, for, for building brand awareness, if I could address this to, to Becky, because that's her, Area, you know, so often people in general think, you know, if I build it, they will come. Um, or students, sometimes in their business plan for the marketing and sales section, it's limited to I will leverage social media at the cost of zero. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what it really takes to 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 build a, a brand and brand awareness? Yeah, uh, for sure. And um, so one of my first. Uh, projects that I led when I was at Droga 5 was uh, Spotify. And <clears throat> Spotify back in whatever, 2012, right, um, had only had 5% penetration. It's very different now. Um, and they were still doing everything on direct response, meaning what they were doing is saying, do you do like this song, click here and join Spotify, right? So what they were seeing from a media dollar spent is when they stopped doing those ads, uh, acquisition would just fall. They didn't build a brand around, they were transactional about it. They're like, you want to hear a song for free, join at this dollar level. And because they weren't saying anything, um, it was going down. So when I was, we were running the campaign out of Droga, and we did an actual brand campaign to say Spotify is for music, they saw pretty much after we stopped doing the brand campaign, 12 weeks of just lift maintaining, right? Uh, the um, 
steady state of acquisition that you didn't have before when you didn't build brand, right? So that's not how it always works, and they also spend a lot of money doing it, and most of us don't have that money to spend. Um, but I, what I'm trying to illustrate is the power of brand for something like Spotify, which technically doesn't make anything except user interface, right? Um, what we found is that when we do go-to-market strategies for our clients, we ask people to um, start with a very clear idea of who their initial audience set is. Sometimes we just, you know, we drive to a page to demonstrate that 5,000 people in two days express interest in it, and that's enough to at least get some seed funding, funding right? And Facebook, uh, Google gives you a set of analytics to see what that distribution is, right? So um, to echo Tom's point, I think we might wait to echo his point, um, that the story around it is, look, in that time of five days, um, 5,000 people were interested in it. Now imagine what happens next. I'm not saying that that's not true, but you framed a context for an investor to say, yeah, I'm going to put my idea of what growth is behind that, right? Your job as the entrepreneur is to deal with the fact when that number doesn't get hit, what's the next thing you do and the next thing you do? So um, I think if you are building for a very specific audience and you can develop word of mouth, 90% of word of mouth still happens offline. It's not about digital. If you can create that sort of sense of loyalty, I have found that that has been the best way to start building your brand, right? Um, you know, it's really tempt, and so uh, social media obviously is great, but you have to still promote any social media because Facebook and Instagram don't really let you not spend those marketing dollars. And don't be afraid to do events. Don't be, be afraid to actually get out there be amongst your clients, your customers, even if you're not even selling a technology or a digital component to it, um, be out there, be the face of it. And whether it's a B2B company or a B2C company, that sort of enthusiasm, I think, is really important to building the brand. And then, yes, of course, <clears throat> you could go hire a fancy agency that's gonna build your brand architecture and tell you to spend $2 million on a spot and all those things, but I think in the early scrappy days, it's about putting on a message of what you're helping them do or what you stand for and being consistent. Is your, is your behavior consistent? So if you say you're about transparency, you really mean that, right? The way Everlane does. Like, they took it to a degree that you're like, okay, I even understand their profit margin. Uh, brandless, right, that does hustle products that are brandless, right? They took a marketing concept but actually built an operation around it. So that, I think, is a, I just wanted to demonstrate, one, the value of what brand really is, because it allows people to be like, oh, I like you because you're consistent. That's really important. Otherwise, um, you may appear really cool in the beginning, but the moment you start disappointing your customers or your, your loyalists, you, you've really damaged your brand. And yes, there's a lot of you know acquisition marketing that you need to do with digital, like, there are definitely experts out there. there. Those are also things that you or someone on your team can learn. Um, so <clears throat> it's not such a black box these days that you can't go in and still really learn to manage your brand in the early days. So I don't want it to feel like anything other than there's a lot of opportunity to just be hands-on as well as being you know, hired by agency. Yeah, that's, uh, then I'm gonna uh, address a, a question to Tom than a different one to David, but um, that idea, sometimes you hear those people refer to as you know, early adopters and evangelists, and it's so important to get those people that are gonna try your product and, and spread the word, and you know, this good guy Kawasaki was the uh, evangelist for Apple, the guy I mentioned Ben Surf, you know, the internet evangelist for Google, and um, it's, it, it's important to find those people. I like the point about having events. I had an online financial services company we did events, and it was funny because you get people that are really connected to the event. For Tom, a number of, number five of five on scaling a business. Tom started this business three years ago, and now it has 17 employees. I wanted to talk like, for me, this is always one of the challenges. Like, if you think about Facebook, Google, like, 
how do you just physically get enough chairs and desks and phones and, and, and payroll and all these systems? Can you just talk a little bit about what does it take to scale up um, sure. what you've done over the last three years? Yeah, yeah, and just to, to number four, just two questions to think about, like what is your brand and who actually needs to be aware of it? Um, and knowing what your brand is is super hard, right? Uh, I don't think we really became comfortable with our brand until the last like year-ish. Um, we're trying to do a whole bunch of other stuff, did all these exercises, and, and it's just, you fall into it, right? You grow into it. Um, but scaling the business, uh, it's sort of a double-sided problem, right? Because you need the talent and you need the work. Um, and you need those two things to be timed really nicely to get the right talent in the door when you have the right work coming in the door. Um, and when you have the right work coming in, you also can't say no. Um, at least in, in my industry, right, service, service company. So it's a linear scale there. Um, but actually growing the company inside of Connecticut, right, it was super small uh, goldfish bowl. And we, we get a lot of attention there because it's not, you know, it's not New York. Um, one of the things that we focused on, like like very, very strongly, was this idea of value, um, and what is it, and who derives what from it, and, and freedom. Uh, so on the talent side, uh, we were lucky enough to hire people that are incredibly talented uh, in Connecticut because they wanted freedom, and they wanted to be surrounded by grass. Like those were the two criteria that people in Connecticut, talented people in Connecticut, have. Um, so, so we were, you know, a big fish in a small pond with that. Um, doing digital, able to attract a, a lot of people there. Um, and on the work side, <laughs> on the work side, we got, we started off until October of 2017. Uh, we were operating out of the basement of a daycare center, right? Like th this was, we were startup. Right, we didn't get get money. We were in, we had four windows. We had no walls, no doors. We had cubicles that were donated. Every uh, table and desk and chair we worked on and whiteboard we had, we either uh, were given free or got from Home Depot for ten bucks. Like that's that's the way that you you're able to grow a culture of people that value the amount of time and energy and work that goes into growing an organization. Uh, in in that like culture. Was was additive to people's work habits. So uh, you know, I'm asking people, in, in especially in the early days, to do highly valuable work, underpay them, but give them the freedom that they wouldn't get anywhere else. And for I think a lot of us, that that means a lot. That matters a lot. Um, so having uh, having team lunch, home cooked meals on Fridays, a uh, ping pong table or a pool table. And you know, I'm not watching the clock for 9:30 for for everyone to be in the door. Like that is able to instill a culture of people that are focused on getting the job done. And however that job gets done, you know, whatever, it just matters that it's done. So that's sort of solved the, um, the 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 finding the talent side of things, just giving giving that freedom and support. But on actually finding the work, it fell a lot more actually onto point uh, point four because we hired very early on, and looking back, this was a great decision at the time, it probably wasn't. Um, we hired a non-technical person to just do partnerships and community. Um, and this person would go to accelerators, incubators, co-working spaces, find any startup in Connecticut, New York, Boston that they could, um, on AngelList or whatever, and just talk to them, listen to their story, and connect them to someone either in my network or his network that could be relevant. We're not asking for anything, purely doing that out of, you should know this person because you're both doing cool things. Um, so having that person ended up creating a lot of spontaneity right, around uh, different people coming in the door and connections that suddenly came back to us uh, needing new things or, or whatever it is. And, and that type of culture um, inside of the company, connecting these random people that end up in our network, uh, ended up giving us a lot of seemingly random new jobs uh, and able to, to balance the, the new team members that friends told friends, right? It was very much so like an internal marketing thing. Uh, almost everyone at Checkmate brought someone else into Checkmate except for the new people, right? And, and that, that's the, the network effect that happened that allowed us to grow 
uh, so quickly uh, for a service company in, in three years. So it, it was that balance of um, helping external people without that expectation of that you know directly correlating to dollars um, and creating a culture inside the organization that people wanted to continue to work with. Right? Like uh, almost every weekend, actually, right now, like people go to the office, just show up and run into each other and you know play pool, uh, drink from the keg or whatever before pre-gaming and going out in downtown New Haven. And that's just people, like friends of friends, just uh, are always cycling in and out. Um, and that's how we're able to, one, trust each other as a team and a unit to know that this is actually gonna get delivered because people are friends, not just coworkers. Um, and it, I think, provides a much better experience for the client, and that that referral is, is everything, right? That, that that connection to the next client is so so meaningful. Great, negative no, and that kind of ties what they like say about ninety percent of word of mouth still happens uh, offline. So, uh, a little bit. We're gonna have time for for Q and A. We do have to finish on time because David's got a, a flight to Paris, but I wanted to finish with um, a question for David. As a, um, a Pace alum who graduated not too long ago and who had kind of an entrepreneurial passion but also worked for a traditional company first, um, a lot of students here might be thinking about that. You know, I'm finishing school, should I go work for a uh, company in a traditional job? Should I go out and try my hand at entrepreneurship as someone who um, kind of did that and, and left base just a couple years ago and did a little bit about both. Do you want to share some closing, closing thoughts on that? I think, I think on, on that one, it depends on your personality. If you like the security of having a steady job that, that pays well or has a lot of benefits, then you will join a big company. Uh, if you like an adventure and freedom, then you will join a startup. So it's um, 15 and with the schedule of Q&A goes till um, 7.30 and we can go a little longer and then we just want to have some time for networking, not just for people to come up and, and speak to the panelists, but um, for you guys to, to speak to each other. So with that, I'm not sure if we have mics, but you could, um, uh, you know, if you just say who you are and, and a question, if you want to address it to someone specific in the panel. Or you could also, um, if you're shy, tweet it to ActAC Lab. So let us open it up for.